Okay, so everyone has been muted. So um, if you will bow your heads, we will ask God's blessing on our Bible study. Our Father in heaven, our great almighty God, we come to you on what has been a beautiful day. Very, very cold here in Alaska, but still a beautiful day, beautiful sunshine. And, and there's a, a gorgeous full moon out there tonight. And we thank you, Father, so much for the beauty of the world that you have created for mankind. As we come here, Father, we want to pray for your blessing upon our brethren. We always have those who are sick. Others are facing great trials. Others are in danger. And yet others have lost loved ones and are grieving. That seems to always be happening. And we pray for your comfort and your spirit to, to lead and guide and, and to strengthen those, those involved. Father, as we come here, we do want to pray uh, specifically for a small congregation at the area of Namwan, uh, Myanmar. Uh, they have, uh, because of the civil war that is raging, uh, they have recently had to completely flee their area. And a lot of details beyond that we don't have, but we pray that you will set your angels around them and protect them and, and just bring them through safely. And we pray for a time when the hostilities will cease and there can be peace and freedom of travel and worship as, um, as we know you would want. And Father, we now want to look a little further into the book of Romans. Uh, we have a lot of things written here that are, that are twisted by, by uh, religious leaders. But Father, we know that it is a marvelous book. Uh, some things hard to understand, but we thank you for it, and we pray that you will open our understanding and teach us, lead us through your Holy Spirit as we look further into Romans chapters 7 and 8. So we thank you, and we ask for your presence here in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Okay, now I'm going to once again put my notes on the screen. And hopefully, is that is that something you can see all right? Now, I should uh, I should introduce for the all of the rest of you. Uh, we have uh, joining us from the country of Myanmar. We have uh, Gum Sengong, and Sengong and his wife Sengpan have pastored a congregation there at Jok Tang, as well as one down in. Yangon, or formerly known as Rangoon, and then also this small uh, Namwon uh, congregation where the the uh, members had to just flee um, here just this last day or so. So we uh, we welcome him. It is, I believe, 11 o'clock in the morning uh, where he is on the other side of the world. Um, Roy, I don't, I think is traveling, so he won't be able to join us from the Philippines, but we normally have are able to enjoy uh, Roy and uh, and or Roy and and his wife uh, Sheila sometimes. So, um, um, the Bible study, excuse me, uh, the Bible study that I did from Manila uh, two weeks ago, uh, we we got through chapter five and six, and then just got started in chapter seven of Romans. So that's where we're going to pick it up, uh, chapter seven of the book of Romans. And in chapter seven, as I pointed out last time, and as you may be able to see from my notes, uh, Paul in this section into the early verses of chapter eight he refers to the law over and over and over uh, by one count 27 times. And he is discussing the relationship of the law of God to the Christian's faith and the impact it still has in the new life that we are called uh, to live in Christ. And so in chapter seven, he's going to focus on the points that I have there on the in the notes that uh, reminds us that the death penalty no longer condemns believers. So by believer, I mean those whom God has called, 
um, those who have repented have been have have accepted and by faith the sacrifice of Christ. Uh, those who have been baptized and received God's Spirit. So so these spirit led Christians are are what I refer to here with the word believers. And because of the forgiveness of sin and being under God's grace, uh, the death penalty no longer hangs over our our head. Now, by saying that, it doesn't mean that that sweeps away the law. And that's where so many Christian leaders take it. They, they hate the law of God, and they want to get rid of it, and especially the Sabbath day. Um, in this section also, we have the fact that the law convicts those who break the law. Uh, in other words, the law identifies sin for what it is. It is completely contrary to the mind and the intention of God. And then point C, uh, the law cannot deliver anyone, any believer from sin. Uh, law keeping doesn't save. Faith in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ does save. And then finally, he gets to the point, and, and actually into chapter 8, we're going to have the whole chapter. It, it could be called the Holy Spirit chapter because it focuses upon the power of God's Spirit and, and how that it within us empowers us to understand, but then also with God's help to live by every word of God, or, or at least do the very best that we can with God's help. Now, uh, again, we, we covered this last time, and I think some of you weren't, weren't with us that time, but he takes the law that governs marriage. He uses that as an example. Uh, as far as in verse 2, the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. And then, of course, this is a covenant between a man and a woman. And then if one or the other dies, the other spouse, the surviving spouse, is um, in, in freed from that marriage. Um, and, of course, in 1 Corinthians, we covered the place where he mentions as far as some of the widows, that would include widowers as well, but they can marry, but he said, in the faith. They need to re, if they re choose to remarry, it needs to be within the body of Christ. Uh, so, anyhow, verse, verse 3, if she remarries while her husband lives she's committing adultery the, the husband but if the husband dies she's free she's not committing adultery and of course it goes the other way as well okay um again verses four five six we covered but just to summarize verse six but now we have been delivered from the law and by that, again, we have to, we, we take a given passage or scripture in the context of the entire Bible or in the context of the entire book here. Paul is going to hold up the law high on a pedestal as far as being a standard by which we should live our lives. He never gives law keeping any credit for saving someone because salvation is a free gift that comes from God based on faith in Christ. So we've been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by so that we should serve in the newness of the spirit, not in the oldness of the letter. So we are called to have a new life. We saw that in chapter six, the analogy of baptism. We enter a symbolic watery grave and we identify with we share in the death of jesus christ but then as he came up from the graves so we come from the waters of baptism but it is so we can live a new life and be a a new creation in god's hands so as we get down to let me let me scroll my notes on up here um, as we as we get to verse seven, this is about where we were wrapping it up two weeks ago. 
But in verse 7, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. Now, there are a number of places where in the King James it is certainly not. It's a very strong, very emphatic statement. The old King James renders this as God forbid. And in part, I, I still miss that. But anyhow, certainly not is, is very strong language as well. And in verse 7, he said, on the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. So this is where I said earlier, the law defines the standards of living. They define the nature, the character, the mind of God. The law de describes the way that we should live our life. So unless we have the law and look to it and study it and seek to apply it in our life, then uh, we, we won't know by what standard we are to, to live. He gives the example of covetousness. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. So he cho chose the 10th commandment as his example. Uh, verse verse 8, but sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire. Or apart from the law, sin was dead. So sin uses specific prohibitions or requirements of the law as its base of operations for launching its its evil work. And here he's talking about uh, how sin taking it, it's like he's personifying sin as if it's a person. It uses opportunities to lead him toward evil. And before a person is aware of God's law, the death penalty in one sense we could say is lying dormant. Uh, but when God opens our eyes, that's when, when there's a knowledge of God's law, then sin does become active and uh, and has uh, has the wherewithal to overwhelm us. In verse nine, I was once alive without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Let's go ahead and read the, first, the next couple of verses. And the commandment which was to bring life, I found to bring death. For sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me, and by it killed me. So as knowledge of God's law grows for any one of us or any, any individual, then there is this growing awareness of where we're missing the mark, of where we are not thinking and acting within the realm of God's intention for mankind. Uh, no individual, apart from, G you know, with the exception of Jesus Christ, uh, no one else has been or will be able to perfectly keep the law of God on our own. Uh, when sin comes to a person's life, uh, with that then, as we break the law, uh, that's what sin is, the transgression of the law. And as we do that, then so comes, so follows the death penalty. And then that's where he talks about uh, at the end of verse, verse 11, that by, by it killed me. So sin killed him or sin brought about the death penalty upon Paul. But let's notice his statement here now in verses 12 and 13 about the law. Therefore, the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. So here's, uh, he continues to use this word law and commandment over and over and over in this chapter. And he says it is holy and just and good. Uh, it is a perfect reflection of God's, it defines God's holy righteous character. It is the standard that we aim for, the standard by which we should want to, to live. And an awareness of the true nature of sin magnifies our desire to, to live by every word of God. So in verse 13, has then what is good become death to me? 
And once again, he uses this very strong statement, certainly not, certainly not, but sin, that it might appear sin, was producing death in me through what is good so that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. Now, some of these phrases, some of these verses are uh, very difficult uh, in the way they're worded. Uh, Paul writes some of the longest sentences of, of any author in the Bible. And, and yet again, an awareness of sin, awareness of the true nature of sin, um, works to magnify our, our lust, or rather our desire, our, our rightful desire to live by every word of God. Verse, verse 14, he begins to get into a section where he's talking about this battle that's being waged within the mind. And you go through it, I go through it, all went through it, everyone goes through it. There is, as it were, this battle, this struggle within the mind. Because as he describes it here, verse 14, for we know that the law is spiritual, you see, the law is, well, when it was given to Moses and Israel, it was etched on tablets of stone, front and back. But that's just the, the, the brief outline of all the spiritual intention behind that. And I'll just point you to the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus said, you have heard of old that it was said you shall not commit adultery. But then he took that and he expanded it to uh, you know, the thoughts of our of our of our mind. That if a man would look at a woman with lust, he has already broken that law in his mind. And so there's so much. The law is spiritual. There's so much behind uh, just the set words: "You shall not covet" or "You shall not steal." There's so much more involved. So the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. Verse 15, for what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do. In other words, Paul, as he struggles with himself, as he studies the law, he knows what is right. He wants to do it. He strives to do it. But he turns around, he says, that I do not practice, but what I hate, that I do. And so Paul begins this section talking about the, the, the negative pulls of, the, of, the, of his own carnal mind and the, the struggle, the battle that, uh, that rages within everyone. Scrolling the notes on up. Now, again, and I think it's good to remember when Paul is writing about this battle that he has, he's been an apostle of God for 25 years, approximately. He's, he's been at it a long time. He has traveled far and wide, preaching the truth, establishing congregations. And if he has that kind of a struggle, I... I I know that's always that's always in a maybe in a in an unusual way comforted me to realize well if Paul had to battle against it then that explains well how how much more so I may have to battle against it so verse uh, verse fifteen we read uh, verse uh, sixteen if then I do what I will not to do so his mind is set. His will is, I don't want to break God's law. And so he's saying, if though I find I do, I agree with the law that it is good. The law brought an awareness and allowed him to understand where he was taking steps in the wrong direction. Verse 17, but now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. And I think this, this is, begins a good section for converted Christians because we have this, this similar battle that is taking place. Um, we, uh, 
and you know he's personifying our human carnal nature as though it is sin and we strive against it we struggle against sin and yet we find that we make mistakes and we we do fall down in sin so paul's converted mind longed to obey god's law but he still had this sinful carnal nature this mind that waged war against what he from his heart wanted and yearned to do so verse uh, verse 18 for i know that in me that is in my flesh nothing good dwells for to will is present with me but how to perform what is good i do not find so the natural self wants to eat if we can use the analogy from back in genesis 3 the carnal mind wants to do the same thing adam and eve did and eat from the forbidden fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil human beings want to determine for themselves what is the moral standard of right and wrong and do as they good and well please verse 19 for the good that i will to do i do not do but the evil i will not to do that i practice verse 20 now if i do what i will not to do it is no longer i who do it but sin that dwells in me so he, he continues this the the again thinking back back to the garden of eden the fruit on both trees were appealing and to adam and eve uh, but very symbolic trees and the end results the way of the tree of life was eternal life the way of the tree of knowledge of good and evil was death eternally as well so paul very under, very clearly understands his own carnal nature and and i'm glad that he wrote this because i think we all can relate to it we struggle the same way in verse 21 i find then a law that evil is present with me the one who wills to do good now law here refers to an inviolable inviolable spiritual principle an undeniable truth of life and his intention is to obey god but there's something within him that fights against him obeying there is another force there is another energy that wars against what his intention is within his mind so in verse 22 for i delight in the law of god according to the inward man but i see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members and then he summarizes the the chapter here verses 24 and 25 he somewhat out of what seems like desperation and exasperation he said oh wretched man that i am who will deliver me from this body of death well he goes on and gives the answer first part of verse 25 i thank god through jesus christ our lord so that is the answer god will deliver us from the body of death through jesus christ who gave himself for us and uh, so then with the mind i serve i myself serve the law of god but with the flesh the law of sin so again he this is his conclusion of this this struggle this battle i have in the notes there first john one first john one verses seven through ten and it says but if we walk in the light as he is in the light we have fellowship with one another and the blood of jesus christ his son cleanses us from all sin if we say we have no sin we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us again in the christian world around us there are those that will take paul's writings 
in an attempt to sweep away the law of God. We'll see in the next chapter the reason why, because the carnal mind hates the law of God. They want to sweep it aside. But in verse 9, uh, 1 John 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So that's uh, that's that's our summary of chapter 7. Let's, let's keep going and get on to chapter 8. So I said earlier, in fact, um, I heard Roy Holiday uh, make this comment um, before as well, that, that this could easily be called the Holy Spirit chapter because it um, it's going to deal with a great deal. We're going to have an emphasis on the spirit, the spirit of life, um, walking according to the spirit. Over and over, the word spirit is used. And so in chapter 8, verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So here he shifts a little bit to the use of the therefore, you know, the word therefore at the beginning. It's, you know, he has clearly articulated the first seven chapters that justification being pronounced sin free being forgiven being uh, receiving god's grace all of that is based upon faith in christ's sacrifice so those of us who in that sense he uses the phrase are in Je christ jesus then we don't have the death penalty weighing us down uh, we can we can walk as paul a number of places, uh, well, I shouldn't say that, maybe a couple of places during his ministry, he mentions that, uh, you know, I've, I've lived with all clear conscience or all good conscience before God and men to this day. And he had a tremendous peace of mind because of the forgiveness that he had been given. So we are to walk in according to the Spirit. We are not to walk according to the flesh. In verse 2, but the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So again, two different ways of life, two, two different ends to life. There's a way that leads to eternal life. There's a way that leads to eternal death. And um, as he just said at the end of chapter 7, that that uh, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we can be delivered from this body of, of, of sin, body of death. Verse 3, but what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. So now the law is not the problem. He said in the last chapter, the law is holy and right and good. The law is not the problem. The problem is us. The problem is carnal nature. The problem is we're we're tuned in to the the broadcasts of Satan the devil, and we have this this struggle that takes place. Uh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, on account of sin, He condemned sin in the flesh. So, verse three: No human being on his or her own can keep the law of God perfectly. It takes something we don't have by nature. It takes the Spirit of God, and we know the steps. God's calling, repentance, faith, baptism, prayer with laying on of hands, receipt of the Holy Spirit. That provides this missing dimension that is the power of God's Spirit living within us so that we can then strive with God's help to uh, perfectly live by God's law, which we, we won't do. We know that. But Jesus Christ came as flesh and blood. He, he came, he was weak. He was flesh and blood. 
but he came to condemn sin in the flesh by the sacrifice that he would give. And also it was to provide a high priest who, who understands and could sympathize. Hebrews 4 verse 15. Hebrews 4 15. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Now we can't say that about ourselves, but it is written of Jesus Christ. In verse 4, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So there are places where the Bible talks about how God then imputes his righteousness upon us. That does not sweep aside the law, as some like to say or try to say. Uh, rather, it means we are expected, with God's help, to try to live by every word. We are to, he used the phrase, we are to walk according to the Spirit. So the person with his mind set on the flesh is headed in the direction that will ultimately be spiritually and spiritual death. The person whose mind is set on the spirit uh, has this spiritual life. And they, they are given a peace with God. Uh, verse, verse five, uh, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. So hopefully with God's calling, uh, we're, we're even greater, better students of the Bible. We're thinking of God's plan and purpose. We're asking the question, where is it all going? And we want God involved in our lives. And we look through lenses, spiritual lenses, because of God's calling. Verse, verse 6, for to be carnally minded is death. So carnally or focused on the flesh, that's going to end in death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. There is a, a peace that, that transcends, that God gives. So God, through his spirit, uh, writes his law on our hearts, in our minds, and the focus of our mind becomes more and more upon God and his will and what he is doing. I think a good scripture to, to keep in mind here that, that underscores what he has just said here in these verses is Colossians 3 verses 1 and 2. Colossians 3 verses 1 and 2. And he says, if, you, if, if then you were raised with Christ, now that's referring back to baptism, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. So it is, have your eyes looking upward to God rather than down at this physical life. All right, verse, uh, verse 7. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. Now, th this is a description of the state of the unconverted mind. We were there ourselves before God called us. A human mind without God's spirit is diametrically opposed to and opposite of God and the law that defines God's mind and character. The fleshly carnal mind refuses. It hates God's law because the carnal mind is, is focused on gratifying their own lusts. So it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Now, verse 9. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. So again, we remember he's writing to the church of God. 
writing to spirit-led members of the church there at Rome, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. So this is the defining difference, the presence of the Spirit of God. Now, just to digress a little, everyone who gets baptized, um, sometimes the baptism, they only get wet, and they are not giving their lives to God and with his help changing. Um, the difference is who has the Spirit of God. And discerning that is a challenge. Jesus said, you know them by their fruits. We can look and see what kind of evidence is, is born from a person's life. But you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, I see it's the phrases are used interchangeably. Spirit of God, spirit of Christ, it's the same. It's, it's the power essence of God, the Holy Spirit. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. So when God called us and then we uh, devoted our lives to God, repented, began, of course, repentance is a, a lifelong process just like conversion is ongoing, we gave ourselves to God, um, the past is, is dead. This death penalty is gone. It's, it's paid for by Jesus Christ. The body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you, who dwells in you. So the, the Holy Spirit, as, as we've understood it in the church, the Holy Spirit combines with the spirit in man. Um, some of you might remember, oh, it goes back into the 1970s when Mr. Herbert Armstrong was writing about this remarkably just incredible difference between a, a human brain, uh, excuse me, an animal brain. The animal brain might even be larger than the human brain, but the human brain has a spiritual element. And I'm not talking Holy Spirit yet. There is this spirit in man that the Bible speaks about several places. That spirit in man with the human brain provides for the power of intellect, of discovery, of planning, of uh, just a whole different dimension. The animal world around us operates by, yes, there's a brain, but it's, it's programmed into them. It's often just called instinct. And they go through the motions of, you know, well, it's time to find something else to eat. And so the herd of cattle goes grazing to find more to eat. And then there's a time when they go and they go and they eat and they drink water. And there's a time when there's maybe danger, a threat, and they and they turn and run. But um, human beings are vastly different. Then there's an even greater dimension when the Spirit of God is given. And again, as we understand, the Holy Spirit combines with this spirit in man that makes a person spiritually complete. Still flesh and blood for now, but there is there, there will be evidence that is born in Christian's life that proves that they have the Spirit of God there. Um, person, a person who does not bear godly fruit, fruit of the Spirit, uh, really has no legitimate claim to Christ. They're just, they're living a lie in many cases. In John 14, verse 26, John 14, verse 26, Jesus said, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, now pausing right there, of course, this was on that Passover night. 
he will be taken captive. He will be killed the next day and uh, then resurrected three days and three nights later. Uh, the next feast of Pentecost is when the Spirit of God began to be poured out upon the church. So he's talking about how it, it will come. The Father will send in my name. Um, again, unfortunately here, he, you know, it's not really a, a masculine gender. It's, it's a new, neutral gender, a neuter gender. The Spirit will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I have said to you. So the Father sends the Spirit in the name of Jesus Christ, and the Father will raise to immortality those who possess the Holy Spirit, just like he raised Jesus Christ uh, back to immortality. And the, uh, in his case, the glory that he had had with the Father before that time. Okay, let's uh, let's go on to verse twelve. Uh, this is uh, this is a long chapter, but I think I think we can cover the basics. In verses twelve through fourteen, I'll just read through those. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if the but if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. And so God gives us his Spirit to give us the extra strength that we don't have on our own. Uh, excuse me. He gives us his Spirit so we can, his phrase, put to death the flesh. And so by the way he's wording this, as God's forgiven, as those who are given the Holy Spirit, we still have the obligation to resist against the negative sinful pulls of human nature. We still have this battle, this struggle, as we strive to live by God's word, by God's law. Now, a similar thought I have here in the notes, Colossians 3, verses 5 through 10. And he's talking here about this principle of compensation, putting off old and putting on new. So in Colossians 3, verse 5, therefore put to death your members which are on the earth. And then here he defines them. Some examples, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. You know, idolatry is anything we place in front of God. Verse 6, because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. You know, Paul said to Galatians, uh, God is not mocked. What we reap, we will sow. Verse 7, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. So he reminds them, and we need to remember as well, where we came from when God called us out of, out of our past. Uh, verse 9, do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds. Verse 10, and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. So the Spirit of God, as we read in verse 14, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God does not try to take over our will. It does not try to force or coerce us. It works through what well, it may give us understanding on the one hand. It may give us this impulse of something, maybe something we say or do, and then there's this thought that, uh, oh, I, I, I was wrong there. I shouldn't have done that. Or it might inspire us that well here's a need we need to we need to get up and go and, and help this person so the spirit of god works there behind the scenes now that's that's opposite to the way that the evil spirits of satan work uh, they are called a number of places familiar spirits and they try to get in there and to uh, enforce their will upon the person they possess or influence. Uh, think of some of the you know, 
the gospels, some of the stories of, of demon possession. You know, the man who was dwelling out in the tombs, uh, the man, no one, you know, they, they couldn't bind him in chains. Uh, just, just very demonic things. Uh, they try to take over, but God wants our heart. He wants us to choose his way. He wants us to strive with his help to do what God has us to do. So the spirit of God works by orchestrating circumstances. There was a uh, one place where Paul mentioned, well, we wanted to travel through Bithynia, but the spirit hindered us. And God was we're showing his will. Uh, sometimes it gives us greater understanding and gives us then at times the strength to do what we can't do on our own. Continuing in verse 15, we get to a discussion about adoption. And, and adoption, as it's used here, just means sonship. That God imparts his spirit to us and we become his begotten children. Um, to become fully his children, his sons and daughters at the resurrection. But in verse 15, for you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Now, Abba is the Aramaic word for father or, or actually a, a little more um, intimate. Maybe we would say daddy, papa, dad. Um, and so it's it's a it's a familial term, and by God, by God's act of adopting us, we were somebody else's children, but God adopts us as His very own, and we become fully legal children of God, and we inherit the privileges of the family of God. Um, we be we become as though we are natural born members of the family you know if in 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 this in our society here in the united states uh, a family can uh, legally adopt a child and that child becomes fully their legal child just like any any ch children they may have already given birth to but the presence of the Spirit of God is what makes us these joint heirs with Christ. And proof of his of the, the genuineness of our sonship is that we suffer with Christ. So let's read a little further here. Abba, Father, then verse 16, the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So that's that's where we 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 see that here's the Holy Spirit and then there's this human spirit. And it's it's working in consort, working together, making us the children of God. And if children then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if in indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. And so the Bible consistently talks about the fact that all who live godly will suffer. And we're going to suffer persecution. We're going to suffer many trials. Uh, we're going to have a lot of heartache. But through the process, God is uh, refining us into uh, very, uh, very finely, uh, very sharp, sharply honed tools for his service. Uh, not only right now, but on into eternity. He continues with the thought of suffering here in verse 18. And let's just let's read a, a few verses here. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. 
Verse 21, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. And that word bondage of corruption refers to decay, the the uh, the universe from the time of its creation. There, there's decay that has set in. Verse 22, for we know the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. And the use of birth pangs, it refers to the the intense laboring that a woman goes through in giving birth to a child. And uh, just uh, a similarity to the the intense pressure and the trials that we go through as we draw nearer to the time when God will fully redeem our bodies. So for now, we, we suffer. We, we look to the glory that will come as God's plan unfolds. And the physical creation is, is personified here, is waiting for the time when, when God's phase, God's next plan comes along and, and the, the, the glorified sons and God will begin the process of, of renewing the earth and cleaning up. There, there's just so much damage and destruction that mankind has, has wreaked upon uh, this, this beautiful created world of God. I mean, just look at some of the areas. Look at, look at the Gaza Strip there from October 7th until present. I mean, we've had warfare taking place and just horrible things. But the whole place is just being destroyed into rubble. They're finding all these tunnels underneath, going everywhere, just an incredible network of tunnels. And um, it's just, I mean, there's so much pollution that takes place with warfare. So in the millennium, where it will be rebuilt from the bottom up. Well, let's, uh, let's pick it up in verse 23. Verse 23, not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit. You see, Jesus was the first of the first fruits. He was, he was the one that blazed the trail. He, he leads the way. We're a part of the first fruits. We're the the early crew that God has decided as in His in His uh, uh, providence has decided to choose us. Uh, we who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of the body. And I think the, the 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 aging process teaches us that that uh, what was the old saying that we reach a point where everything that doesn't uh, doesn't hurt doesn't work, and uh, you know that's okay. It's a part of the process. It's it's uh, as Denise's dad used to tell us: the aging process is not for sissies. It's uh, it's uh, challenging as you start moving into those those phases where, as one man told me years ago, he said, "Well, you reach the point where everything around you starts getting heavy because things change and you don't have the muscle mass. Your body doesn't build muscle, and things that you would have picked up and moved, you have to brace yourself, and you have to be careful, or you have to." Uh, work smarter um, and and get it done in another way. So we groan within ourselves. We wait for the time when God, when the feet of Jesus Christ stand on the Mount of Olives on that Feast of Trumpets, and and uh, the dead in Christ are born of spirit. Those living are born, excuse me, born of spirit. Verse 24, for we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Now, I, I think I covered this earlier in this book that uh, John MacArthur is one commentator that I was reading, and he, he mentions that, that the English word hope carries a degree of uncertainty. We might say, I hope it doesn't rain tomorrow. Well, we don't have control over that. 
but apparently with the Greek word that is translated hope in the English Bibles, um, it doesn't have any uncertainty. The Christian's hope is sure, it is certain, and it is subject to the timing of God. It will be realized because Christ has already guaranteed it by what he, by what he did for us. Verses 26 and 27. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So here, here are a couple of fascinating verses, especially verse 26. Uh, there, there are those, yes, who will look at verse 26 and they'll say, see there, the Holy Spirit is a member of the Trinity. Well, no, it doesn't say that. Uh, it, is, it is there to help our weaknesses. It is the essence of God. It is the power of God. And as, as it says here in, in praying, we, we don't know what we should pray for as we ought. And I think we all are that way. We have something we want to present to God and we just don't have the words or we don't know the appropriate way to bring it up or how to express it. And I think that's where what he's saying here is the spirit of God within us, that God through that senses the intention of our heart and kind of fills in the gap there that the Father understands what we're attempting to say very imperfectly. But at times in prayer, I think God brings thoughts to our mind uh, as far as what we should be praying for. Uh, in Hebrews 7, verse 25, uh, of course, you know, verse, 20, verse 26 here in Romans 8, uh, there are those who look at it and they say, you know, well, here the Spirit it is a it is a member of the Trinity. It's it's the intercessor. Uh, no, it's not the intercessor, inter intercessor, because Hebrews tells us that Jesus Christ is the one who goes and makes intercession for us. So Hebrews seven twenty five. Therefore, he is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him. Speaking above of Jesus since he always lives to make intercession for them. So Christ is our intercession, intercessor, and he lives in us through the Holy Spirit. Okay, let's go to verse uh, 28. 28, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. You know, there's a tremendous amount in these, in these phrases here. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn of among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he called. Whom he called, these he justified. Whom he justifies, these he also glorified. So the Father uses all the events in our life, suffering, lust, temptation, in order to bring about his eternal purpose. Whatever it is, God is there and he is using it to bring about his purpose. Those who love God will be striving to keep his commandments. Now, he says, let's see, where is it? The word called, yes, the end of verse 28, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Now, a calling is an invitation. You might get a, you might get a, um, a letter in the mail, and it is a formal invitation to a high school or, or college graduation. It might be a wedding invitation. 
And of course, with God's calling, when he extends that invitation, it depends on what we do with it. If we throw it in the trash can, as a lot of people seem to do, then, you know, they're, they're treating with great disrespect God's calling. Uh, they're not even aware of what they're doing. Um, but if we open it and we recognize I'm being invited to a wedding and then we respond, then it begins a process that takes place over, over a lot of time. But everyone to this point has not been called. The vast majority are just waiting for the time when God will, will invite them. And But God foreknew, these words foreknew and predestined, God foreknew, God foredestined that there would be an elect who would be conformed to the image of his son. Okay, let's... Uh, Oh, pre predestined means to mark out a point or determine beforehand. And predestination has to do with, with when God calls a person. You know, some are called from the womb. You know, Jeremiah, God said, you know, I, I knew you in your, in your mother's womb. Um, there are prophecies in Isaiah where uh, God, through Isaiah, named by name uh, the ruler Cyrus, who would be the ones, the one to issue a decree to send the Jews back to Judea. And and God has predetermined there'd be this group of first fruits that would be called. But you see, it depends on those who get that calling. What do they do with it? If they cast it aside, that person can't be se selected to be a part of that that early crew, the first fruits. So anyhow, predestination has to do with when God decides to invite certain ones. So let's let's then go to the latter verses here, and we'll we'll wrap it up. Uh, the latter verses are basically focusing on. I, I love there in, in the latter part of verse 31, if God is for us, who can be against us? Um, and Paul's point is, since God is for us, and since God is with us, and since God has given us his spirit, who can stand against us? Now, these latter verses, some commentators call it a, a hymn of security. You know, if God calls, works in a person, he's going to complete that plan. You know, we don't have to worry about that. But verse 31, if God's for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not uh, with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? So here he brings in some terminology as if it was a, a trial in a courtroom. Um, people can say what they want, but as he says, it is God who justifies. Verse 34, who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God who makes intercession for us. Verse 35, who, who will separate us from the love of Christ? And then he asks, all these you know, shall tribulation take us away from the love of Christ? No. Distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword, none of these things can separate us from the love of God. As it's written, for your sake, we're killed all day long. We're counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Because the glory always goes to God. The power is God of, of anything we are able to do. I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, or nor depths, nor any other created thing 
shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So who can condemn us? No one. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Nothing on heaven or earth. And let's again remember here in closing Philippians 1 verse 6, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. So that's where we will wrap it up for tonight. I'm going to take the notes down and certainly feel free to unmute and